anyone is celebrating a birthday this week. Oh, yeah, we have some. Anyone celebrating an anniversary this week? Uh, Harold, Margie and Harold Henry's anniversary is today. 62 years. 62 years. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on to announcements, and I'm not sure there are any. Cody's shaking his head. No, there's no announcements. But I have a couple. I have a thank you card from Nancy Hansen, who's in charge of the I Can Bike program in Fulton. Uh, it's just not a Fulton program. There are several different um, places that they have that. It's for children that have some disabilities that can learn to ride bikes. And they have a camp for that in the summer. Our, our church helps to uh, support that. It says, I just wanted to send you a note to say thank you for your donation to I Can Bike Camp. I appreciate it so much, and I'm excited for camp to happen this summer. Thank you for believing in this program and helping me make this camp a reality. It just means so much to me that words cannot describe it. Mark your calendars for June 14th through 18th and plan to come and witness the joy. It's a week-long camp. It's just a day camp for several hours a day. Um, they'll advertise it. I think if you'd like to come and help, uh, there are kids that need help learning to ride the bike, you can contact Nancy Hansen, and I'll put this on the board. And last month in, in February, um, the church from their mission budget gave to the I Can Bike, Bike program $500. $1,000 was given to Young Life. $500 was given to Agape Flights, which is an organization that flies supplies and mail into missionaries in different countries. And $1,000 was given to Worldwide Mobility, which is we used to call Petco, and they've changed their name. They're out of Columbia, Missouri. So that came from our church mission budget. So if there's no other announcements, Mrs. Smart is going to have candles lit. to warn you just a little bit ahead of time, I'm well rested this week. <laughs> Which, man, I need to apologize to all of our uh, Sunday school teachers for getting early service at about 15 minutes late, so be warned. Uh, as we're looking at our theme this week, uh, we've been talking about being Bible-based, we've talked about being discipleship-driven, and for the month of March, we're going to talk about being mission-minded. And our text that we're going to look at is a little bit longer than the past two, but don't worry, this doesn't count toward sermon time. Uh, now in Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 8, we, we get a story. It says, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip, 
when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. What we're going to look at this month is how the gospel spread to where it spread. Okay, we're going to track through the book of Acts the different places that the gospel went. So the first thing we're looking at this week is that Philip preached to a group of people who many viewed as dogs and traitors. Notice where he went. He went to the city of Samaria. Who lived in Samaria? Samaritans. Did Israelites and Samaritans get along? Yeah. No. So Philip went to people who didn't look like him, didn't think like him, didn't act like him, and preached the gospel to them. Church, if you want to reach people for the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's a good chance that beforehand they are not going to look like you, they're not going to think like you, and they're not going to act like you. But that is our mission field. The church of Jesus started out in Jerusalem. It started out mostly Jewish. Mostly Israelites were Christians. But the second point we're going to look at is why it spread to different groups of people. The first part of that says, now there, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. The gospel spread originally because the Christians were being chased out of Jerusalem. They were being persecuted because of their beliefs in Jesus, and therefore the church was scattered. Bad things were happening to Christians, and that is what actually moved the gospel forward. So church, the other, the other point I want to make to you this morning is this. Just because something bad is happening to you, it might not be something overall bad. God will use bad things or difficult circumstances to further his Work. We can see that in the example of Philip, but we can see it in our own lives too. So sometimes you will pray to God when you have a struggle. For example, if I'm hurting, I typically pray to God, hey God, take away my pain. Okay. Sometimes you will have that prayer and God will say no. If God says no to that, and sometimes it's not an audible no that you can hear, sometimes he just doesn't say yes. Okay, that can make you frustrated. Don't let it make you frustrated because God can use your pain for a bigger purpose. And sometimes the reason he doesn't give you what you want right away is because he has something bigger in mind. The church had to go through that persecution in Jerusalem and had to be scattered so that the gospel would reach the Samaritans and then way other people down the line. Keep that in mind as you go throughout this service today, but also as you go throughout your week. That first of all, the people you're trying to reach might not be your best friends. They might be your worst enemies. Okay, the people that God calls you to minister to might be the people who give you a hard time, who are difficult to be around. All right? And the reason you might be out in the, the mission field, the reason you might minister might not be because your life's going perfect and great. It might be because things are tough. That's okay. That can all still be part of God's plan. With that being said, let's transition into prayer time here. Does anyone have anything they want to praise God for? Yes. I get to go to my sister last Monday. Praise God. Yay, that's wonderful. Good. Glad to hear that. Anyone else? Oh, congratulations. Well, good. Good. That's awesome. Good. Amen. Cancer still in remission there. Act excellent. Awesome. Anyone else? I have to praise God. There's a reason I'm well, well rested. Kelsey and I took a baby moon this past week, which in case anybody doesn't know what that is, it's an excuse to go on vacation when you're about to have a baby. Um, so we road tripped all over mid-Missouri and just had a really great time. And uh, the, the big praise to God and all of that is that oftentimes I have to read the Bible for work. Okay, obviously, I'm a pastor. It's my job. Um, so that's a big part of what I do on a daily basis. But every time I'm doing that, you know how you can do something for fun, but then when you do it for a job, it can become a job, obviously. Uh, so when we were on our trip, Friday morning, as we're in, you know, as we're in our motel place, uh, I got to just open up the word and I started reading. It was like, I'm not doing this to prepare for anything in particular. I'm not doing this for my job. I'm literally just doing this for fun. And it was such a freeing thing to be able to just do something that, that I've loved so much that I've been able to 
devote my life to it and make a, you know, a career out of what I love. But I was able to just remember the reasons that I love the Word of God so much and just have that great time of fellowship and freedom and to just get away. And it was really, really nice. So I praise God for that. Anyone else? All right. How about prayer requests? I have an update uh, on, on Marge Henry. Her surgery is this Tuesday, the 9th. Um, so, so she messaged me this morning about that. I was really excited for her and Harold to be able to celebrate their anniversary today. She had posted on Facebook is the only reason I knew it was their anniversary. But, uh, you know, so she could use some prayer going into this. Uh, check in with her, too, if you don't mind. You know, just give her a call, send her a message. She gets back to Facebook messages pretty quick, usually. Um, but she's going to be going through that Tuesday and could use prayers on that. Any other prayer requests? How is Audrey? I haven't heard any updates on Audrey. Yes. She's not here. Weird. Okay. So she's still really weak, but she had a very good dinner one night. Um, so, so a positive sign there. So that's good. Um, any others? So potentially the husband and the wife both going through cancer at the same time. That's, that's rough. All right. Keep them in prayer. Anyone else? Yes. Hmm. So a one-year-old, uh, his nephew that has cancer and is going to have surgery this week. Keep them in prayer as well. And that's rough. Anyone else? All right. Please bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you first and foremost because you are worthy of all of our praise. You are worthy of all of our honor and all of our glory. Dear God, you are good, and your plan for us is good. Your plan for us is salvation. Your desire for us is salvation and for life, eternal life. And we praise you first and foremost for that. Dear God, we also come to you in our time of need as the many needs have just been listed that dear God, are, are almost more than we can bear. They are more than any of us could bear or solve on our own, dear God. And that is why I praise you, because we have you that we can come to with each and every one of our needs. Dear God, we hate cancer. We despise it, dear God, for it's taken so many loved ones already, and, and it's so hard to watch people go through such a, a painful and debilitating disease. So, dear God, I ask that you, that you give healing to those who are struggling with cancer, dear God. Please meet these needs that have come up in our church. And, dear God, please give people courage and strength through it, dear God, for however you bring them through, be it by miracle or by medicine. Dear God, I ask that you equip us as a church to be the source of comfort and to be a source of strength for people, dear God, to take the Holy Spirit, and to take the name of God and the name of Jesus to people who are struggling, who are sick and afflicted, that we might be the presence of God to them at a given time. Dear God, likewise, for people who are struggling in a very different way, not with physical sickness, but who are lost and dying and on the path to hell, dear God, I ask that you would equip us that we might stand in the way of that path. That we might be there for them and lead them to you. To lead them to your cross, O oh God. To lead them to paths of righteousness. Dear God, I ask that you use this church and I ask that you use this service for that end. Dear God, equip us that we might be the salt and light of the earth that you've called us to be. That we might be that shining city on a hill that people can come to and know that they might find refuge. That they might find safety and that they might find hope here. Glorify your name, O oh God, through all that we say and do, through our praise, through the preaching, dear God, through communion, and through all things. I ask in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Ephesians 5.25, the second half says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, 
And that's us. <laughs> Please stand as we sing our first hymn. always sing better standing up. <laughs>
went to the cross for us so that we could be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, Jesus loves even me. Join me in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for just the songs that we've sung this morning. I thank you that you love us. Dear God, I thank you for what you did for us on Calvary. Dear God, I just praise your mighty name for, for left to our own devices, oh God. All of us were hopeless and undone, but I praise you that you have given us life. Dear God, as we would normally, I suppose I say normally, as we've entered into this new normal, this would normally be the time that we'd take an offering. So, dear God, I just want to thank you for, for the people who give in this church, oh God. Thank you for, dear God, we're not truly giving anything to you that you haven't already given to us. So I thank you for that opportunity to give back. And, dear God, I ask that you give us continued wisdom as a church to use the, the money that we're given in a way that glorifies you and advances the work of your kingdom. Dear God, I ask that you give me wisdom as I, I preach on your word that you've given me this morning, that you hide me behind your cross, that you might shine through. I ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Turn once again to the book of Joshua, chapter 11. I've got a few warnings, probably isn't the right word, but I guess it will be. I've got a few warnings to give you before we really jump in. The first warning I already sort of gave you, I'm well rested. Uh... I had a lot of extra time to relax and really just get away and reflect this past week. But in my reflections, I've been going through something strange. Uh, and I don't know if it's because I, I just hit my 30s this past November, just started entering into that. And I, or I, it could be because, you know, I'm about to be a father for the first time. And so you can tell me whether or not this is something that a lot of people go through or if I'm just a weirdo. Um, but I've been reliving... A lot of different childhood moments. I've been going back through, just in my memory, really in very specific moments, a lot of the most embarrassing moments of my life. I've been thinking through those and, and remembering just how bad some of those times felt. Or just, not always just bad, but how awkward I was. And just a lot of the different difficulties, most of which I created for myself. 
just actually as we were singing, you know, I was thinking, uh, at first my, my reflections were of a really happy time. There's a man who led singing from the time I was born in my church all the way up until really I moved out here, by and large. His name's Earl, and uh, just a lot of these songs that Donna picked this week, th those were some classics to me. Those were all my jam, you know. So I started thinking about that, but then, you know, I was thinking about my childhood and thinking about when I was in sixth grade and playing basketball in sixth grade and just, you know, I was at that age where I still wasn't that skilled, but the inner performer in me was coming out that when I would make a mistake, uh, I remember airballing a shot and I felt awkward about it, but I had to do something about it. So I, I made fun of myself out loud in the middle of the game to the crowd. It was a very cringy, very weird thing that I did. And my coach pulled me out to sit me on the bench there. And so for some reason that came to my mind because so I could have extra time to think about it. And just remembered how awkward and uncomfortable I was then. But like I said, I don't know if that's just where I'm at age-wise, but I've been having a lot of those reflections recently, and that really ties in to what we're going to look at today. Another warning I need to give you before we dive in. Chapter 11 of the book of Joshua is actually very similar to chapter 10. In chapter 10, we traced the victory of the Israelites in the southern part of the promised land, and in chapter 11, we're going to look at the victory in the northern parts. The text is very similar. My challenge for you is do not get bored of this text. All right now, now, let me explain to you what I mean by that. This victory is so resounding, and we're going to talk about it. They win so decisively that it's not even really that exciting of storytelling. You know, you'll hear me say this again, but when you read about the Battle of Jericho and the strange things that Israel had to do, there are tons of sermons over that. There are even songs over that. Another sixth grade memory. Anybody ever sing that song? Joshua fit the bat, fought the Battle of Jericho. Yeah, we sang that when I was in sixth grade choir, okay? Uh, there are lots of stories about that. You probably won't find as many sermons about Joshua chapter 11. Okay, it's just as relevant of text. It's just as good of text. And in fact, the victories in chapter 10 and 11 overall are more vast and bigger than the Battle of Jericho. But it's just not as exciting of a story. But that's interesting. And it's going to play into this part. But what I'm telling you is do not... Uh, zone out. Do not zone out because what we're going to look at in it is actually a different perspective than we looked at last week. And last week, it really in most part, I was focusing on the perspective of the vanquished, the people who lost the battle and how time is very short. But this week we're going to talk about the winning side because church, we are on the winning side, but we need to see a pattern that developed in Israel because it's going to be very important for us. And I hope it's very encouraging to us. So with all of that being said, let's dive in to Joshua chapter 11. And I will likely butcher a lot of these names, but I, I hope none of you have been to seminary and can correct me on them. So just keep that in mind. When Jabin, king of Hazor, heard of this, he sent to Jobab, king of Midon, and to the king of Shimron, and to the king of Ashaph, or Akshaph, or I said, some of these are hard. We don't speak this language, so it's not a native language. Okay, and to the kings who are in the northern hill country, and in the Arabah south of Chinneroth, and in the lowland, and in Naphoth Dor on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and the west, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Jebusites in the hill country, and the Hivites under Hermon in the land of Mizpah. All right, so after the Israelites defeated the coalition of five kings in the south, the kingdoms of the north created an even larger alliance to try and defeat the threat of Israel. All these kings are making contact with each other and saying, hey, something has to be done about these Israelites. And they came out with all their troops, a great horde, in number like the sand that is on the seashore, with very many horses and chariots. The description provided in this chapter indicates that the armies of the north were far greater in both number and resources than the armies of the south. Because once again, you know, first of all, we see their, their number is like the sand of the seashore. That's significant. We're going to come back to that in just a second. But not only that, it also mentions how many horses and chariots they had. Horses and chariots were the superior uh, tools of war in that time. So this army of the coalition of kings in the north was vast, was incredibly vast. And when you see the phrase, like the sand that is on the seashore, 
for me, that directs my attention to another battle that's still in the future. So before we leave the theme of looking at the, the losers in the war, if you want to turn there, you can, but I provided for you Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years, but then it says, and when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for a battle. This is the final battle. And notice how their number is described. Their number is like the sand of the sea. This vast army that can't even be numbered, because you can, you can get the imagery in your head. If you've ever been to the seashore, you can see the beach. It would be like trying to count each grain of sand. It's just innumerable. It's so vast. But look at the end of this army in Revelation. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, but fire came down from heaven and consumed it. That's the entire battle. It's not, oh, these, these soldiers fought valiantly and there was, you know, an ongoing battle. No, they gathered to fight and fire consumed them in a moment. And then the story moves on from there. Much of what you're going to see in Joshua 11 is similar to that story. So keep that in mind. Getting back to Joshua, it says, And all these kings joined their forces and came and encamped together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. This absolutely massive army prepares to attack Israel all at once. And yet the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. For tomorrow at this time, I will give over all of them slain to Israel. You shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. So God promises to give victory to Israel, but not only does he promise to give them victory, but he promises that by this, this time tomorrow, the victory will already be complete. This army that is massive, you know, that, that is numbered as the sand of the seashore, is going to be completely decimated within a single day. So Joshua and all his warriors came suddenly against them by the waters of Merom and fell upon them. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel, who struck them and chased them as far as Great Sidon and Mizrephoth, Maine, and eastward as the valley of Mizpah. As far as the valley of Mizpah. And they struck them until he left none remaining. Once again, whereas you might expect to hear a story of a magnificent battle, you only get a couple of verses. That's how resounding of a victory this was for Israel. It was so one-sided that the recorder of the book of Joshua didn't feel the need to spell it out any further than that. All right. What I want you to understand this morning, has anybody ever seen the movie 300? When I was in high school, thinking, speaking of memories, I was in high school when the movie 300 came out, and I loved that movie. Oh my goodness, I ate that movie up. 300 Spartans standing against 10,000 Persians and fighting and fighting, and yeah, they might have lost, but they fought so valiantly in this losing battle, but it's just, you see the whole story of it all playing out, and it's exciting and it's heavily dramatized. And then for this battle, you get a couple verses. They won such a resounding victory, they, left, they, struck, they struck them until he left none remaining. They decimated their enemies. And Joshua did to them just as the Lord said to him. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire. And Joshua turned back at that time and captured Hazor and struck its king with the sword. For Hazor was, formerly was the head of all those kingdoms. And they struck with the sword all who were in it, devoting them to destruction, and there was none left that breathed, and he burned his oar with fire. Joshua followed the commands that the Lord had given. He killed all the people, destroyed all the instruments of war, and burned down his oar, the leading city of the region. And then all the cities of those kings and all their kings Joshua captured and struck them with the edge of the sword, devoting them to destruction, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded but none of the cities that stood on mounds did Israel burn, except Hazor alone, that Joshua burned. And all the spoil of these cities and the livestock the people of Israel took for their plunder. But every person they struck with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, and they did not leave any who breathed. Just as the Lord had commanded Moses' his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So we see in the story Joshua's obedience is displayed 
relative to the commands of Moses, once again showing God fulfilling an earlier promise to Joshua, showing the people that as God was with Moses, so he was with Joshua. And then not to bore you, but then it continues on. So Joshua took all that land, the hill country and all the Negev and all the land of Goshen and the lowland and the Arabah and the hill country of Israel and its lowland from Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir, so as far as Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon below Mount Hermon. And he captured all their kings and struck them and put them to death. Victory after victory after victory to the point that it can become, it can sound redundant. All right. Let's keep going a little bit further. Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. He kept having victory after victory after victory for the rest of his life. There was not a city that made peace with the people of Israel except the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. They took them all in battle. For it was the Lord's doing to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle in order that they should be devoted to destruction and should receive no mercy, but be destroyed just as the Lord commanded Moses. Now we're going to take a little bit of an aside from our main point here. But notice, first of all, no other people acted like the Gibeonites acted, but the Lord drew everyone into their judgment. So here's your aside. All right, this is your two for one special. God brings all things towards their fulfillment. All right, let me explain that. The Canaanites were wicked and were deserving of judgment. But the Lord hastened their judgment by hardening their hearts so that they wouldn't hold up and try to cower or try to beg for mercy, but that they would become arrogant and march out to their doom. All right? He allowed them to become so puffed up that they would go out and fight and be destroyed. Likewise, in chapter 10, the pagan kings were living in darkness, and they tried to use darkness to escape from Israel. Okay? Therefore, God gave them over to complete and utter darkness when Joshua rolled the stone over the tomb for the cave. What I'm getting at is this, because this is important for us to understand today. Good and evil are both going to grow until the end. All right? Understand this. Right now, the world around us is sinful. Amen? Unfortunately, it is the case that the world is sinful. And would you say that now it is more or less sinful than it was 10 years ago? Probably more sinful, okay? That is actually part of God's overall plan. Does God want the world to be sinful? No, but because the world is sinful, God is going to draw out more and more of that sin to show us so that we can see just how sinful they are and so that the world can see just how sinful it is, all right? Know that. Know that contentment is not part of the sinful nature. Sin is always seeking to grow. This is why drug addiction can be so harmful to a community and so harmful to people. Because there is not a point that someone says, okay, I have enough of this. No, they always have to keep expanding to reach a further and further high. All right? Drug addiction is that way. A lot of other, every other sin that we see is the same exact sort of way. If someone is an adulterer, you guys know, you guys, you... You know how the world works. They don't just want to, you know, uh, do their business with one person. They want to go around. And guys actually in the world become very popular by doing that, right? Girls get a very shameful name oftentimes by doing that in the world. But that is how the sin nature works. It always wants to grow. It wants to keep going and keep pushing boundaries. We've seen this in our society with what has been considered normal and what has been considered acceptable. Those boundaries keep getting pushed further and further and further. Is there any natural stopping point for boundaries to stop being pushed? No. We might see things and be like, oh, this is terrible, but wait 10 years from now and see what we'll think is terrible then. A lot of things that were considered absolutely terrible as short as 10, 20, 30 years ago are normal now. It's not even a big deal anymore. Okay? Sin is going to continue to push the boundaries. And it's going to push it to a certain point, all right? There is, there is a point of judgment that we need to understand because it's mentioned two times in Scripture. You guys have heard the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, correct? If you've been coming to church here for long enough, you have, because I preached on it. Uh, it's been almost two years ago now. But Sodom and Gomorrah isn't the only example of, of the events that happened there. We're going to cover those in a second. But actually, later on in Israel's history, when we get to the book of Judges, we're going to see a story that parallels Sodom and Gomorrah. You're going to see just how far sin can go. 
Because in Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, we can try to reduce their behavior down to a lot of different things. But what really happened was that the entire town, every single man in the town, was a co-conspirator in a plan for the public sexual assault of two men who were angels who came into their town. All right? How in the world do people get to that point? This was not a single illicit act by someone who was, you know, uh, a rebel in that society. This was a collective group effort by the entirety of that town. How do people get to that point? Restraint has to be completely eliminated. That's how people get to that point. Lot was the last righteous man in Sodom. That's why he was saved out of Sodom. All right? He was likely in government. He was likely an official of sorts because his presence was near the city gates. And that's where the, the leaders in the city would go. But keep in mind, when these visitors came in and Lot tried to give them lodging, the townspeople were willing to tear down Lot's door to try to get to these men to commit their illicit act. They were not willing to listen to Lot or anyone else. The fullness of wickedness was on full display so that we might understand just how worthy of judgment Sodom and Gomorrah were. Now, if God were to rain down judgment on the earth right now, we could probably feel a lot of compassion for people who were still in sin. And you should feel some sorts of compassion. But the thing is, for God to show us why he has to judge the world... This restraint on sin has to be taken away so that we can see sin for what it truly is and how destructive it truly is. Paul will later mention in his writings that when the restrainer is taken out of the way, that's when a lot of these end times events will happen. And then all the theologians talk about, well, who is the restrainer? Is it the Holy Spirit? Is it the church? Is it this or that? What is that? I don't know. I can't tell you definitively. But right now, wickedness is being somewhat restrained. The church plays a part in that. The Holy Spirit plays a part in that. There is a moral compass that still exists in our culture. Amen? Okay, that, that compass is being moved. It's not necessarily pointing as straight north as it has been at one time. But there is still a compass. And so wickedness will want to eventually completely eliminate that compass. They were willing to kill Lot to do what they wanted to do in Sodom is what I'm getting at. All right? The thing is, God is going to show his people just how sinful sinners really are. You can have compassion on them now, and you should have compassion on them, because God does not desire that anyone should be destroyed, but he desires that all should reach repentance. But the more resistant the world becomes to repentance, the more wickedness is just going to shine through, and it's going to become more and more obvious. When you see some of these, these criminals and some of the very wicked things you, that they do, it is easy to say, yes, they are deserving of the punishment that they get. You might still want to have compassion for them, but you can at least understand why they're facing judgment when they've committed certain acts. Wickedness is going to continue to grow until that sort of evil becomes normal. Until sin becomes so normalized that the world around doesn't even bat an eyelash at it. But thankfully, I don't want to be too negative here. Thankfully, sin is not the only thing that will continue to grow. Righteousness through God will also grow until the end. All right? And that's really what I want us to focus on in this passage that we're in. Because sin is growing, and what we can do as a church, because honestly we have the wrong mindset, is we can become discouraged about the world around us. But let me tell you, what that actually is, is because in a lot of churches we've shifted our focus from Christianity to something called Christendom. Christendom is different from Christianity in this way. Christendom wants to create a world that glorifies God. We were never sent here to try to make the world holy. We were sent here to try to save people out of the world that would not live according to the ways of this world anymore. We're not here to exert our authority over the rest of the world, but to live differently so that they can see and glorify God and come to Christ. That's the goal. Amen. But the problem is when we start to get Christendom in our mind, then we become like the Catholic Church was in the Middle Ages. Okay? Now, if you're a history buff, you can look into that. 
Uh, you, you can have whatever opinion you'd like on Catholicism now. I'm not going to talk to you about them now. But historically, you can see what they did. It became something that was politicized. It became something that was very worldly in nature. And it became something that was very corrupted. Right? Because they had an earthly focus. It was all about trying to make the world fit into this box of Christianity. We can't do that. We're not called to do that. If we could do that, Jesus would have done it the first time he came. All right? Because Jesus came the first time and said, oh, you're going to set up your kingdom here on earth. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is righteousness, and righteousness and sin cannot coexist forever. And so Jesus has given time for sinners to come to repentance and join the kingdom of righteousness before judgment comes. All right? If he would have set up his kingdom right then and there, every sinner would have had to have been destroyed because God does not abide with sinners forever. But rather, he gave us an opportunity that we should be saved, that we could be saved. And I'm so thankful that he has waited so long to return because his patience is salvation. That patience will eventually run out when wickedness reaches its final fulfillment. When the days are like the days of Noah and the days of Lot, where every thought of man is on evil continually. And his heart is completely corrupted. We're not there yet, which is scary to me. I don't, I don't want to continue. We talked about this a little bit last week. But it's scary to me because I see the world around me and I see that things are getting bad. And I say, come Lord Jesus. And I think he's coming soon. Do you think he's coming soon? Amen. I really hope so. Okay. But what scares me is the things we think are bad now still do not compare to what we see in Sodom and Gomorrah. The world says, oh, those were just, you know, primitives of people. But no. That is the result of where sin is headed. That is the kind of stuff headed in the direction of a sinful world. But let's get back to our story here, because there's something far more important for us that I really want us to grasp. We're not focusing on the losers of this war. We're focusing on the winners. Verse 21 says, And Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron, from Deber, from Anab, and from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua devoted them to destruction with their cities. Let's remember something about the Anakim. Way back over 40 years before, when the Israelites first scouted the Canaan land, what was their reason that they didn't want to go? They were afraid because they said, there are Anakim there. There are giants there. We're like grasshoppers. And there's no way we can defeat them. Look how boring the story was here. It wasn't even a big battle. Joshua came, cut off the Anakim. He destroyed them every single place they were at. There was none of the Anakim left in the land of the people of Israel. Only in Gaza and Gath and in Ashdod did some remain. So there were a few pockets of them left. But by and large, the Israelites slaughtered them. They took them out. These people who were such a big threat that they would never be able to stand against. Wiped out like they're nothing. Later on, Goliath was likely a relative of the Anakim. Okay, so when, when we get to that story, you'll see. Because the, the remaining enemies, the Philistines, you know, we'll get into all that when we get there. But, but keep in mind, the people of Israel have become so strong through the Lord that even the Anakim could not stand before them. Even the Anakim were just given a couple of verses in the story. They're not even able to mount a formidable defense that's worth telling this big, drawn-out story. They were wiped out. Verse 23, So Joshua took the whole land, according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses. And Joshua gave it an inheritance to Israel, according to their tribal allotments, and the land had rest from war. Joshua had complete victory in every war in his lifetime. The Israelites prospered and fulfilled much of the command that God had given them to conquer the land. But what's really important and what I really want us to grasp is to keep in mind where the Israelites were at just a few short chapters ago. We covered chapter 11 today. But in chapter 9, just two short chapters ago, these are the same Israelites that fell for the Gibeonite deception. Just four short chapters ago, these are the same Israelites who lost a battle at Ai because of the disobedience of one man. This is one generation removed from the Israelites who could not seem to get out of their own way. They would take one step forward and they would take two steps back time and time again. 
But there's a great moral of the story today. When you finally get things right with God, the victories start rolling in. When you finally get things right with God, righteousness becomes possible and righteousness starts to become the norm. That is our goal. When you understand who God is, what he expects, and how serious he is about those expectations, and you buy into his program, nothing, literally nothing, can stand in your way. And as I mentioned already, these victories were so one-sided or so easy that they don't even make for that exciting of literature. When you hear testimonies, you know, you know it's a church, uh, maybe a cliche, where the most exciting testimonies are often from the people who live the most difficult of lives before salvation. And so some people who've had a pretty straightforward life, they feel sort of ashamed to even share their testimony. They say, you know, I don't have a lot to share, you know, it's been mostly boring in that sense. But praise God for that. Praise God for that. If your life story is around the age of, you know, whatever age it was, I got saved and I started following the Lord and I've had some problems, but it's been joy unspeakable and full of glory throughout those problems all the way. Whenever problems come up, God provides a solution. I'm able to solve it. Whenever I stray away, he's brought me back. I haven't had to, to go to the worst doldrums of this world. I haven't had to see just how far sin can take me because I bought into the Lord's program. I followed him by faith. What an amazing story that is for that to even be possible. But that's the story of what happened with the Israelites during the life of Joshua. Unfortunately, what happens with the Israelites during the life of Joshua does not happen with many of the generations that follow. This was not a permanent, you know, hey, we finally got righteous and figure it out and we're going to do it forever and ever. Unfortunately, that's not the case. You're going to see when we get to the book of Judges, things can fall apart very quickly in subsequent generations. But the nation of Israel during the reign of Joshua as their leader finally figured it out. And you can see victory after victory to the point that they have rest in the promised land. They finish the job in some ways during the life of Joshua. So here's a question for you. So let's turn this to us. Do you want righteousness to be easy. Do you want it to be easy to do the right thing? I do. Sometimes I find doing the wrong thing is very easy and doing the right thing is very hard, amen? amen? Okay, go to a buffet line. See how easy it is not to get that extra plate that you don't need. My, my stomach gives up far before my eyes and my mouth do when it comes to food. My stomach says, oh no, you should really stop. And my eyes say, oh, that food still looks good. And my mouth says, that food still tastes good. And I keep eating, even though I should not. But, but let me ask the same question in a few different, different ways. Married people, do you want to be a good spouse? No one said no, at least. That's nice. <laughs> Parents, do you want to be a good parent? Let me confess to you that our baby moon was great because... I've been feeling a lot of stress about becoming a parent. I've heard all the stories and all the warnings, and they're all true. Being a parent can be a terrifying thing, and I want to be a very good parent. But the problem is, I can't be a good parent or a bad parent until the kid gets here. I can do all the preparation I want, but, but I can't walk through some of those things until, until he's here, and that's terrifying to me. But I want to be a good parent. Do you want, so this one's a little bit more universally applicable. Not everyone's married. Not everyone has kids. Children. Or I'll say children, but you can be an adult. You still have, you know, parents. Do you want to be a good son or daughter? Students, do you want to be good students? Do you want to make good grades? Do you want to not get in trouble? I did. I still do. Overall, do you want to be good? Are you tired of getting in your own way? Amen. Me too. Thank you. I am exhausted of getting in my own way at times. You know, really, when I was about 19 years old, that's where it really hit me. I, when I got saved, one of the reasons I was 
ready to buy into God's program as I finally saw what doing things my own way was getting me. I so finally saw some of the consequences. Because, you know, when you're in high school, you're sheltered. A lot of things that I would do wrong, my parents could just make up for. But then when I was finally out on my own a little bit, I started seeing some of the consequences for my own actions. And I started realizing that no matter how hard I tried, no matter how much I tried to do good or to be good, I kept getting in my own way. And it hurt. I can't be alone in that, amen? amen? If you're tired of getting in your own way, there is an answer. And his name is Jesus. And I know this can sound cliche if you've been raised in the church your whole life. I know you've, you've probably heard this and seen it time and time again. But if we look at Matthew 6, it's a really simple command. Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. If we make the first priority of our lives the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all of the other parts of our lives, God will all of a sudden give to us. If we get our relationship right with God, if we get things right vertically between us and God, everything else, we will start to find the solution to every other aspect of life. It's not always going to be easy and simple, but by and large, it is far easier and far more simple than when things with God are wrong. There's a stark difference between the Israelites during the time of Moses and the Israelites during the time of Joshua. It's not that Joshua was superior to Moses. In many ways, he was not. Moses is looked at more highly than Joshua in, in you know, Israelite history. But the biggest difference is, during the time of Joshua, the Israelites finally figured out faith and obedience. The Israelites during Moses' time frequently took the commands of God too casually. They thought God must have just been playing around about some of this stuff, and so they tested him on it. And then when he punished them, they say, oh no, what have we done? They took God too casually. But in Joshua's story that we can see, especially in chapter 10 and 11, they finally got it figured out, and they had victory after victory after victory. Likewise, if you want to get your life figured out and get it on track, it starts with getting right with Jesus. When the Israelites lost at AI, they could have regrouped in a different direction. Oh, our tactics were wrong. We just needed to adjust the strategy. Oh, we just need to train our soldiers differently. That's the worldly approach, right? Oh, I just need to go about this differently. You know, I just have to try in a different way to figure it out. And after all, they had, you know, way more people than the city of Ai. They could have beaten Ai by their own strength. But if they would have tried to just readjust by their own strength, they would not have been prepared for this multitude where whose sand, you know, they were like the sand of the seashore. They wouldn't have been big enough to take them down. One of the biggest errors that people make in their life Okay, and I, I think I could be speaking to some people here today, and so I want to make sure, if you've zoned out, make sure you focus back in right now. Many people get this flipped around. They think, if I just clean my life up, then God might want something to do with me. If I just clean up my act a little bit, maybe then I'll go to church and I'll fit in. People will spend their entire lives trying that, and it never, ever works. It is a lie of the devil. Satan wants you to think that you need to clean yourself up, and then you can go to God. If you could clean yourself up, there was no need for Jesus to die on the cross. He had to die on the cross because we couldn't clean ourselves up. The solution is, get things right with him, because he's God not just over our faith, he's God over the whole universe. He knows how everything works together. He knows how everything operates. Not just stuff about the book, not just stuff about the faith. He knows how to make you better at your job. He knows how to make you better as a, a spouse. He knows how to make you a better parent. He knows how to make you better, better, just without anything at it. He knows how to make you better because he's the one who wrote the owner's manual to your life. He created you. He formed you in your mother's womb. He understands you better than you understand yourself. I said, I've been reflecting back on so many of my awkward years and, and thinking about, man, if I was God, I wouldn't have wanted anything to do with me. I've done so many goofy, embarrassing things. 
But yet, when I got things right with God, none of those things mattered anymore. It was amazing. Once you get the relationship right with God, everything else starts to turn around. When you get right with Jesus, you can start having victory after victory after victory. The Israelites were embarrassed at Ai. If you go back just a few chapters, they were embarrassed because they lost to a really small group of soldiers. And the other people heard about that loss too. And so that's why they gathered up and said, oh, they're weak. We got to take out these Gibeonites and then we, we might stand a chance against Israel. Did God hold that against Israel? No, it worked into his plan that Israel could take them all out at once. And then this bigger coalition heard about the smaller one losing and said, oh, we all need to gather up. And Israel took them out pretty much all at once. God will use your greatest shortcomings, the areas that you felt the smallest about in your life. He will redeem those and turn them around and give you victory. Getting right with Jesus is actually very easy, too. Now, easy, relatively speaking, it's really tough to uh, come to terms with yourself at times, right? It's tough to say, yes, I need help. Especially men, we do not like doing that. As men, we like to say, I've got it figured it out. I can do it. But staying right with Jesus can be hard because men, even after we get saved, we still like to say, hey, I can do it. I can figure it out. But what I want you to see through this story today, it is an example of success. Christianity is not easy. Living for God is not easy, but it is doable. All right. The problem is a lot of times we've made some uh, excuses or some cop-outs in the church. There, there are some who say, hey, I sin every day in thought, word, and deed. Where do you find that in the word of God? Anybody know? It's not in there. John says if you claim to be without sin, you deceive yourselves and the truth is not in us. It's not that you know we've completely gotten rid of all of our sin, but I don't have this excuse and I say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to sin every day. I'm going to sin in how I think. I'm going to sin in what I'm going to do. No, why do you have to? If the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, you do not have to sin. You still can sin. And we fall short all the time, right? We do still sin. But you don't have to sin. Righteousness is possible through Christ, is what I want you to understand. You do not have to sabotage yourself every single step of the way. You can have victory in this life over sin because that is what gives God glory is when we walk in righteousness, when he takes people who were completely hopeless and sinful like us and turns us around so that we can walk in the newness of life, walking free from the power of sin, getting victory over sin. That is what God wants for you. Do you think God ever wants you to sin? No, absolutely not. All right, so then why do you still sin? We want to at times. He's got to work those things out of our heart. And he is working those things out of our heart. But we need to come at this from a position of victory instead of a position of defeat. Many times in the church now, what I'm getting at is we've seen so many examples of defeat that we think that defeat is the only option. Oh, I'm going to try so hard, but I know I'm just going to mess up. I know I'm just going to fall short. Says who? You're just like the Israelites in chapter 8. You're like the Israelites in chapter 9. Oh, there we go. We just messed it up again. Yeah, I know we're supposed to take this land, but Achan just had to keep that stuff from Jericho. Oh, we just messed up again. The Gibeonites, they tricked us. But they were right on the brink. They were so close to figuring it out, and they did. The Israelites had plenty of obstacles. Like I said, we've looked at so many of those. They made plenty of mistakes, but at some point, they finally figured it out during the time of Joshua. I've said all of this somewhat repetitively recently, but you absolutely must understand that right now, all that God has to offer you is mercy and grace. If you do not get things right with God, he will have judgment to offer you down the line. But for the time being, God wants you to have mercy and grace. Many fall away because staying with God can be very difficult. But here's my last question. And here's what I'm going to close with. I say last question, but it's, you know, still have a few minutes. 
Are you going to give up on figuring things out with God, on truly getting the relationship right with him, because it's hard? Let's understand this, okay? I, I don't... This could be taken as a motivational speech that'll get you feeling really good right now, but then you'll go and by Monday or Tuesday, you'll forget all about it. I don't want that to be the case, all right? There are so many things in life that we give up on because they're difficult. I've given up on a lot of hobbies because I just didn't get it right away. With a lot of those things, it's not that big of a deal because it's not something super important. If I never learn how to use, you know, I, I'll consider it embarrassing for now because I'm just not good at it yet. And, you know, I would love to learn to like record and produce some really cool music. I think that'd be a really fun hobby. And so I've tried to do a couple things every now and then, but that's really hard to learn. And so typically I just sort of set it aside and ignore it for a while. But that's not that big of a deal. But what I'm getting at is the sake of your soul and your overall life and being is not something that you should just give up on because it's difficult. There are some difficult things in life that are worth figuring out. You're going to have obstacles. You're going to, at times, take one step forward and two steps back. But the thing is, victory is possible. And you might be in this position that you are just like the Israelites with the Gibeonites. You might just be having one last big setback before you really get it figured out. Before you really step forward and say, you know what? No, things are right now. And you start to see that pattern of victory. You might be like the Israelites at Ai. You might have a couple of big mistakes left to make, but you're still so, so close. You know, one of the things that's been difficult for me to understand when I reflect about my past is this question. When was I actually saved? Boy, that one can keep you up at night, just in a weird way. When I was six years old, I was in a Baptist church. I was raised in a Nazarene church, and so my dad worked with a, a lady at this church. And she always liked to brag to my dad that, yeah, he might go to the Nazarene church, but he was saved in a Baptist church. So it was in a Baptist church. I don't even know why we were there. I was six years old. I was playing with toys during service, but I'm a multitasker where I like to sometimes have things just sort of piddle with, but I'm listening. And the preacher made an altar call. And it was as clear as day that I told my dad, I said, Dad, I need to go up there. And he's looking at me like, you haven't been paying attention this whole time. What are you even talking about? And I said, Dad, I need to. He's like, are you sure? And I said, yes, I'm sure. And I went up there and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior. Great. I started the journey there. When I was a middle schooler, so I was six years older, there, thereabouts when I got saved. Then I get to middle school and all of a sudden I'm a knucklehead again. Here's an embarrassing story if you want one. You don't, you know. I'm sorry I'm giving you guys all this ammo, but when I was in seventh grade, you know, I wanted to be a Christian. I wanted to follow God. My friends started using some uh, vocabulary words that I did not use. I'll let you guess what those are. And I wanted to be able to fit in with my friends. And so I talked to God one day in prayer and I said, God, if you don't want me using these words, show me a place in the Bible that says not to use these words. And I did the old flip a Rooney where it's like, nope, it's not there. All right. And so then the next day, I started saying some of those words. But when I said them, because I wasn't used to saying them, I said them at about this volume. Because I was scared to say them. I thought a lightning bolt was going to come out of the sky or something and strike me down. But I felt so dirty after using those words that I only made it about a day. And if that was all, you know, <laughs> Gertie Two Shoes Cody, okay, he figured it out and he moved on. No, then I got to high school. I'm sorry. If you're in high school, I'm sorry. I'm just going to say I'm sorry for where you're at in life right now. High school is not a fun time. I used to think it was the best years of my life, but that's where I have the most moments I look back on and cringe. Um, and that can be because of the way I look, the way I dress, but usually it's because of the way I acted. I began to treat people like I saw other people treating people. I learned that the way to have success as a man in high school was not to be a nice guy. The way to have success as a man in high school was to gently, or maybe even not so gently, bully your best friends. You know, to insult them, to say a lot of mean stuff about them. And likewise, that was actually the way to be able to get girls to go on dates with you. This sounds completely backwards, and guys, you better not try this. But I'm telling you, it'll work. If you're mean to them, for some reason, they feel like they have to prove themselves to you, and they'll go on a date with you. I learned that pattern of behavior, and I became an absolute jerk. 
Does that change the fact that I had went and said that prayer at, you know, six years old? No. But my behavior was not at all glorifying God. I was not acting as I should have. But I still professed to be a Christian. I still went to church every week. I was still really involved. I still went to church camp. I loved church camp. There were so many girls there I could hit on. Okay? It was so much fun. I'm sorry. I'm getting real transparent today. All right? I was living for myself, and I was actually so far from God, but I thought I was on the right track. I was just like the Israelites in the wilderness. I could not get out of my own way. I grew with so much confidence in my ability to play basketball, and I was so arrogant and so full of myself and so wicked all at the same time. And I wanted to give up. I never got to the point that I was suicidal. Let me, let me not, you know, I never got to that point. But there was a time the spring of my freshman year of college when my house of cards was starting to collapse around me. And forgive me if I've told this story before, but you'll hear it again and again. That I remember saying to someone, which I used humor as a coping mechanism. And my friend Nick had come up to me. And I remember just looking at him and laughing while I said it. I said, I feel like I'm dead inside. And I really meant it. I was 100% genuine. My life had become a shambles. I stayed up all night playing video games. I slept through class. I was wasting all my money for college. I lost a lot of my friends because I wasn't the kind of person I would want to be around. And all of a sudden, I found myself becoming increasingly alone. And I deserved it. I remember... A football game, a flag football game. Oh boy. Intramural sports. That you can be everything that you never were. We played against the other team on our hall, and we lost the game on a controversial call. I jumped up to catch the ball, and it's flag football, so it's supposed to be non-contact. I got my legs swept out from under me. I dropped the ball. We lost the game. I was so mad that I walked back to my dorm without saying a word to anybody, and I didn't talk to anybody for about two weeks, because that's how big of a deal it was to me. I was so weak and undone. But it was in that moment when everything had fallen apart and most other people had abandoned me. God was there for me. Alone, the summer after my freshman year of college, my parents were on vacation, going somewhere, I don't know, they travel all over the place. On my living room floor, I had my mattress in there because I was sleeping in the living room for some reason because I was a weirdo. Um, and I said, God, I've done things wrong, basically. I came to the end of myself and said, I've messed it all up. And there wasn't a, oh, no, Cody, you're great, that we would say to each other if we said something like that. But I, I finally just surrendered and gave in and said, okay, God, I'm ready to do things your way. And so I can't tell you exactly what moment I got saved, but I can tell you from that moment on, my life changed. And it was a change that everyone else could see. Where I still made a lot of mistakes. In fact, if I'm remembering correctly, that story about walking back to my dorm room, that might have actually been my sophomore year. So I might have already been following God at that point. But I still had some things to be worked out. But something happened on that day, which is why that day is stuck in my mind more than any others, because that was the day that I started heading from defeat towards victory. That was the day that I stopped getting in my own way so much, because when I would do wrong, there was less of a desire and a compelling to put on a good face, like, no, I knew what I was doing the whole time. I was doing right. You guys are wrong. There was a willingness to accept that, God, I need you. Some people haven't come to that point yet. You might have been raised in church your entire life, but you just never got to that point of true, full, and utter surrender. But you might be really close. Church is an interesting thing. It's a beautiful thing, and it's a gift of God, but sometimes church can become a strange place to grow up. Like I said, I... I didn't get preached at a lot. I might have mentioned this in early service. This might not have been a late service. I didn't actually get preached at a lot. A lot of sermons didn't convict me growing up because a lot of them were reaching out to the people who were weak and broken and undone. And I thought I was very strong. 
It's putting on a front. So I didn't get convicted a lot in church. I was very successful in church. I was one of the leaders in church as a kid. But I was still lost and undone. But I'm very thankful, and this is, this is where I'm bringing this to so that I hope you can relate to this. I have a number of other friends who were raised in church who probably went through a similar experience to what I went through. But rather than giving up on themselves, when they reached that point, they gave up on God. They saw just how hard it is to truly live for him, just how hard it is to meet that mark, said it can't be done, and turned away from it. They saw the people around them pulling them in a completely different direction, and said there's no way I can keep resisting this, and just fully gave in. Church, what I want you to know is that victory is possible. In church, victory can be very, very close. Very close. You don't have to live in defeat your entire life. You don't have to be a slave to sin. I still have areas of sin that I'm trying to get victory over now, but based on what God has done in my life since I was 19 years old, when I truly surrendered to him, I have seen victory every single step of the way. Okay, and I, I'm not exaggerating there. Every single step of the way. I had gotten myself in debt because of my poor decisions when I went to college. God has been delivering me from that debt. I changed my major about half a dozen times because I didn't know what I want to do. And in my own way, that would have worked against me for getting a job. But it's amazing. God redeemed that. I had taken classes in education. I had taken classes in philosophy and religion. I took classes in marketing. I took classes in music. I took classes in all sorts of things. But it's amazing. God has used every single one of those to put me in the exact right job at the exact right time to use the skills that I've already had while giving me more skills. It's been victory every step of the way. With relationships, I told you, you know, I was a mess in high school and shortly thereafter when it came to dating. But God has blessed me with a wife who is far better than I deserve. And like every other married couple, and you need to know this, every married couple has fights. I love the way that Kelsey and I fight. We have victory in our fights. All right? I mentioned that we fight. I joke around about that. But we have victory in our fights. Because we don't go to bed angry with each other. And if we do, we stay awake until we figure it out. We have victory. We win when we have these fights. We win when there's an issue that not just fights with each other, but when there's something in life that we look at and we say, I don't know how this is going to work. God has not once let us down. He has not once abandoned us or hung us out to dry. We have had victory after victory after victory together. Church, it can be the same way here. All right? We have setbacks at times, amen? COVID-19 was a rough setback. But do you not think that God wants to use COVID-19 to refine us and to transform us? To use it for his glory? Church, we can have victory after victory after victory all the days of our life. The only thing standing in the way of that is us. And the only thing standing in the way of us getting that victory is our relationship with God. If, this is an if, because guys, you can see there are tons of churches out there. My friend back home joked that sometimes in certain towns there are more churches than there are people. Okay, There are a lot of churches out there, and you can see a lot of examples of this, that this if is a really tough if. But if together... We come together and get right with God. Now, notice, I'm saying this as something we still have to do. Okay? I believe that we're preaching the truth here, and I believe we are heading in the right direction. But I know. Okay, I'm going to get really real with you. Sorry, I'm, I've already preached long today, but I hope I've still got you. I hope you haven't fell on asleep on me yet. I know that there are hurts. I know that there are wounds. I know that there can be some bitterness, there can be some difficulty, there can be some frustration that we might have that is keeping us from achieving all that we can achieve as a church. But what I want you to know is that if you are willing, if you are ready, 
If we can get right with God as a church, we will be the kind of church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. What does that mean, though, when we say the church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against? Well, the thing is, if the enemy is trying to get after you, that typically means you're doing something right. Right? Okay? The problem is, we give in to him too easily because we think, oh, I'm going to sin. You know, I'm going to fall into sin, so, you know. The really easy way to get rid of temptation is just give in to it. You're not tempted anymore. That was kind of a joke, but unfortunately, that's often the truth. All right? Church, if we are willing to be resolute and say, yes, God, we are going to do things your way. We are going to live your way. We're going to structure how we go about things your way, and we buy in with God's program, we will be able to get out of our own way and we will struggle to fit everyone in this church who will come in our doors. And numbers is not the only measure because the church can be a mile wide and an inch deep. That's not the only measure, but we will have lives changed. You guys will be the best spouses you've ever been. You'll be the best parents you've ever been. You'll be the best children you've ever been. You'll be the best employees you've ever been. There can truly be something different about us than the rest of the world around us. Do you want that? The example we're given here in the book of Joshua, victory became so common that it wasn't worth telling a story for each battle. It was so normal that it wasn't a surprise. That they recorded all the victories in just a couple of short chapters. Wouldn't you like that to be the case for our church? What's stopping it? The only thing would be us. As always, as we're getting ready to go to prayer, the altar's open during the time of prayer and our time of communion. Here's the thing. If you want to pray by yourself, you're more than welcome to. If you want to pray by yourself, you'll probably need to pray where you're at. Because I guarantee you, because I know this church and how loving and kind people are. If you come up here to the altar... Someone's probably going to come pray with you. You might want that. If you want someone to come pray with you, please come pray at the altar. If you want to pray by yourself, you can pray where you're at. But here's the thing. We can let our fear of failure keep us from ever trying at any number of things. You can let your fear of embarrassment keep you from getting right with God. I did a lot of things that, that I had to humble myself to do. You know, during worship... Some people will raise their hands, and that's really tough for some people at times, right? It was really tough for me to do that, because I'm a tall guy, so if my arms are up here, it's up there for everybody else to see. And I might, okay, I think we're good as far as that stuff goes. But it can be humiliating. But you know what this is? This is a sign of surrender. This is a sign of I give up. Your way, not mine. Church, don't let fear keep you from surrendering to God. Fear is the work of the enemy in that. If you get right with God, and if we collectively get right with God, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that will be able to stop us. That is my goal, but it takes each and every one of us. If, like I said, if you want someone to pray with you, come on up. If you want to pray where you're at, that's fine, but please join me here in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I feel as though I've spoken very boldly this morning. But dear God, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for this platform to be able to testify about the work you've done in my life. But dear God, also just your word. For dear God, what a wonderful, what a wonderful story that we have here. Dear God, what a wonderful story of victory after victory after victory. We long for that in our lives and we long for that in our church. Dear God, help us to overcome any sort of fear that would keep us from that. Help us to overcome any sort of desire that would keep us from that. Any selfishness, anything like that. Rid us of all of that for the sake of your kingdom. Dear God, let us see that victory in our lives and in our church that others might see and glorify you. Dear God, that once again when we see you, when you return, or when we go to you, that you might say, well done my good and faithful servant. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God. Renew in us a right spirit. Let our relationship with you, let our faith in you be just as it was as a child. We might have faith like a child that no matter all the obstacles we've had along the way that can make us bitter, that can make us hurt, that we lay aside all those and say, I trust you, God. I'm ready to do things your do this work in us, O oh God, I ask in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand as we sing our communion hymn.
Heavenly Father, what a blessedness and what a peace is ours as uh, we walk with you. And Father, we just uh, are thankful for the, the time together uh, uh, under your word this day as uh, a body of believers and we uh, stand upon your promises. And we're just thankful for the, the time that we've had and we thank you for this time to come about your table and commune with you. Father, we, we truly do it. Uh, help us to truly do it in, in remembrance of you, remembering the, uh, the life that was broken, the life that was given, that we take of this bread, Father. And, uh, we're thankful for our Savior's faithfulness to, to be obedient to you and to, um, to uh, hang on the cross for us, Father. And likewise, we're grateful for the Holy Spirit that Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit did not give up on us, that it uh, worked with us in, until we came to that time where we uh, surrendered. And Father, we're thankful for that. And, uh, this is our prayer that you, uh, you might continue to sanctify us, Father. Uh, help us to have that desire to be sanctified. And Father, as a, not only individually, but as a church family, Father, we just pray that you'll be in and about us, Father, that we will uh, truly get out of our own way and that uh, we'll have, that uh, your way will be done. Uh, and uh, we desire that greatly, Father, that we might be used mightily by you as a church body. We seek that and uh, we're thankful that uh, that you would uh, care to even uh, use us, Father. And, uh, Father, we just uh, stand here uh, thankful and uh, standing on the promise that uh, that this week goodness and mercy will follow us. Thank you in Christ's name. And Father, we do thank you again, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity together before your throne, Heavenly Father, and to acknowledge that you are the Savior of this world, as well as the Creator of all life, Heavenly Father. And now, Father, just bless us as we continue to worship you, your Son, Jesus Christ, Heavenly Father, and thank you for the joy of life. Lord, we love you. We love your Son, Jesus. For it's through his name we pray. Please stand as they sing our closing hymn.
in the words of Jesus, he said to his apostles when he was sending them out, he said, I send you out as sheep among wolves. Okay, keep in mind as you're going throughout this week, just as this story says, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Now, thankfully, we're not being scattered because of persecution, but each and every one of us is going out into your workplace or just in your community, wherever you're at, you are in the mission field to be the example of Christianity to all you come into contact with. And the story goes on, but basically what I want you to understand is this. The people you are reaching out to might not always be your best friends. They might look different than you. They might act different than you. They might think differently than you. But Jesus Christ wants them to be saved, okay, just as he wanted you to be saved. So keep that in mind. If there's anything holding you back from that, any root of bitterness or anything, you've got to let that die. Let that surrender to the cross for the sake of the kingdom. Please join me in one last word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you be with his people as they go. Dear God, that you equip us all, that we might count you as worthy of our lives, O oh God, and that we might give you what you desire from us, that we might give you control, that we might live in a way that pleases you, and that we might see those victories that come about from that and give glory to your name, for you are indeed so very good. Please, Lord, keep us and guide us forward, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful week.